appreciate you. Sorry about some of those technical difficulties. So this this morning, um, I there, there's probably going to be several hiccups throughout today's service and throughout today's message and, and whatnot, partly because last night we had a couple of calls and I haven't slept since 2 o'clock in the morning. So I'm already like three energy drinks and at least two pots of coffee in me right now. So I'm living on a prayer and coffee right now. So please just understand that. Uh, so please be gracious and forgiving throughout today. Uh, it, regardless, it's a, it's a blessing nonetheless to be worshiping with one another. Uh, today, though, we are going to be in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. So please start making your way there with your, your Bibles in hand, ready to hear God's word. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And I'm, the title for today's message is Crucified or Crucified with Christ. And I, I'm very, very excited to be able to preach on this topic today, this verse today. Um, I began to prepare my message for both verse 20 and 21 this morning. And throughout the beginning of the week, I was like, yep, that, that seems like a good amount to go through. And as I just kept on looking into verse 20, I, it was just too much to unpack for both verses. So... Because of that, we're just going to stick with one verse for this morning, verse 20. And verse 20 is a text that teaches about our justification, how it is rooted in the death of Jesus Christ. And the proposition for today's text that I would like to present to us today, that I'd like to explore through verse 20 is this. If we have been crucified with Christ as our federal head, then we are called to live by faith in him. Now, you might be in the back of your mind thinking, what does federal head mean? What does that mean, Braden? I, I hope that we'll be able to define that and explore that idea and doctrine through today's message, especially here in verse 20. But let's go ahead and pray before we read. Uh, but we are going to read verse 16 to 21. But let's go ahead and pray first as we approach the text. Lord God, I would ask that today you would be glorified. Lord, that the, the energy level that each one of us may have in this room might be adequate to approach your throne today in worship in a, a holy and worthy manner, Lord. We, we approach this throne, we approach your praise and your glories and your riches uh, in, the, in the blood of Jesus Christ. We, we live by faith, as we're going to read here in a moment. So, Lord, God, we don't, we don't come to this throne in our own ability, but through what you have done for us, Lord, we want to approach this text and our worship towards you today in, Lord. So God, help remind us of this, help keep us faithful to the text, help keep us faithful to the word of God. And Lord, I would ask that you would be magnified through today's uh, just reading and preaching and worship. And I ask this in your name, Jesus the Christ, amen. So let's go ahead and read verse 16 to 21 for this morning. It says this, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners in Christ, then uh, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I die to the law so that I might live to God. For if I, or excuse me, this is the text that we're in right now for this morning. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, Christ died needlessly. Let's pray again. Lord, God, we, we do want to be living a life that is possessing and demonstrating and owning the faith that you have granted to us, the faith that is placed in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Lord, I would ask that you would just help encourage us today that we would know and remember that the salvation that we have 
received in Jesus Christ that began with faith is continually given to us through faith, that it is not through our own righteous works that we have been saved, but it is through your death, your burial, and your resurrection, Lord. So God, may we look to your life and see your act of obedience. May we be reminded today of what you have done in our place upon the cross. And may we just be comforted that you have defeated death, Lord. God, I would just ask that you would just give me strength and endurance to be able to preach a word that is, is adequately magnifying and teaching of your character. Lord, I ask this in your name, Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. So this letter, uh, we, we needed to discuss the context. Of course, every single time we open God's word, we, we need to keep context in the back of our mind. And so the context for this is that this letter, the, the letter of Galatians, the letter that is sent out to the churches of Galatia, is Paul rebuking in very harsh words, as we've already seen, and it's going to get even more harsh here in a moment in coming weeks. Paul is rebuking the churches of Galatia for allowing the Judaizers to influence and infiltrate their churches. Now, I can guarantee you in that day, put yourself in the shoes of these, these churches of Galatia, I, I can guarantee you, there were people in those churches that said, the Judaizers, they're good people. I, I would let them watch my kids. They're, they're genuinely good people. They do all these good things. They're, they're meaningful. They're good. Does being good people take precedence to the purity of the gospel? Recall back to Galatians 1, 8 through 10. Look at this with me. It, it says in here, but even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we have proclaimed to you, let him be accursed. Does it give a qualifying statement on there saying if this person's a good person, you can let them remain? No, it says if they have a, a false gospel, accursed, cut off. Verse 9, as we have said before, Paul is so clear in this that he tells us this twice. As we have said before, so I say now again, if any man is proclaiming to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, let him be accursed. Why? Why is Paul so adamant about this? Verse 10, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were trying to still please men, I would not be a slave to Christ. Paul, Paul's saying, I, I'm okay to forego all my friendships and all these things that I have with these supposed good peoples if that means the purity of the gospel is at stake. During Bible study, even this week, one verse that stuck out very, very clearly in my mind was Hebrews 13.9. We, we were talking about the what the church has been called unto for our Bible study, the topic of the church. And Hebrews 13, 9 says this. It says, do not be carried. This is, this, is, this is the instructions to the church. This is the marching orders of the church. And there's a long list of what we are called unto, how to live our lives as saints in Christ Jesus. And one of those things is, guess what? Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings. Do not let strange contradictions to the gospel come in and influence the church. It doesn't matter how nice, how great, or how good these people are supposedly. If they are teaching something that is in contrary, that is varied or strange to the gospel, they are to be accursed. And we even looked at this Wednesday for our Bible study, we examined even Revelation 2, through, 2 and chapter 3 as well. And in there, out of the seven churches that this letter is being written to, to the book of Revelation, John, who is authoring this, who is writing these things down, it says that there's five out of the seven churches that are rebuked for different things that have happened. And some of them have been carried away by varied and strange teachings. The very first century, churches who had seen Christ crucified, they were led astray by false doctrine. This is something that is very, very serious for us. There's a real danger in allowing false doctrine to remain in a church. Over time, I can guarantee you, if a false doctrine remains in any church, it doesn't matter what church it is, it could be Valley Baptist, it could be a church down the road, it could be a church in the next town, it does not matter, it can potentially decimate the people therein. How do I know this? Why can I say this adamantly? 
Just look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, the a coming text that we're going to look at here. It says this, O foolish Galatians, who bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? In other words, what, what is Paul saying to this church? Stop being stupid. Jesus alone saves, and if he didn't, you would die stupid and condemned. Stop being stupid. Jesus alone saves you. Stop trying to reason that, that you through your circumcision, you through obeying Moses, this is what makes you righteous before God. No, it is what Christ has done in Christ alone that he has done for you that saves you. Also, last week, as context goes, we discussed in depth, I would hope that, I, I, I would hope that we talked in depth last week on what the law was uh, and we discussed what the law was specifically to the unconverted, as it is a mirror that, that exposes, it's a mirror that exposes our sin unto God. And also, the law now, as converted individuals, it's now written upon our hearts and upon our minds. And we follow God, utilizing the law to glorify Him, not as a means to justify ourselves, may it never be, but as a means to glorify God in the way that He has called us unto. So let's now look back at verse 20. Now that we kind of understand the context of what's going on, the book is, is written to rebuke Judaizers and the churches of Galatia who have allowed them to come in and influence and infiltrate them. We now have verse 20 here, so let's read this. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I have been crucified with Christ. A remarkable statement that the Apostle Paul makes here. When Paul says this, when Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, does he mean that he was hanging next to Christ upon his own cross as Christ was being crucified? Uh, no. It, it does not mean that. Of course not. Paul is not meaning that he was physically hanging next to Jesus, but rather he's referring to a spiritual reality that he, Apostle Paul, and let me be clear in saying this, extending this to us, you, me, and all the saints throughout the, the last 2,000 years and all the saints in the coming years, guess what? They have all experienced this through Jesus Christ. We have all been crucified with Christ. What Paul is referring to in here is known in theology as the doctrine of federal headship. And like I said in the proposition, we, we might not know what that word means. That might be completely foreign and new to us. It's a, it's a doctrinal term. It's one that is very important for us. It's one that we find as a concept throughout several places in God's word. And what federal headship as a definition for us goes, it refers to the theological concept that a single individual represents the totality of a larger group. Federal headship is a doctrine that, again, we find it throughout God's word. And I want to give us two examples followed by a third chief example, which I'm assuming we could probably all guess what the third chief example is going to be. It's going to be Jesus. I'll just give you a spoiler alert right now. And we're going to be looking at this verse 20 text to talk about that. But let's look at two other examples before we talk about Jesus. Romans 5, 12 through 18. Let's turn there if you, if you wouldn't mind with me. Romans 5, 12 through 18. Many theologians would say that, it, that Romans 5 is the most theologically deep chapter in all the Bible. That, that, that's something I've heard several pastors and teachers state. But verse 12 through 18, in this very heavy, doctrine-dense chapter that we will not be able to unpack all right here by any means, says this, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. Again, what was that definition that we gave for federal headship? One man represents the totality of a larger group. Through the one man, sin entered. And now it has spread to all. That's federal headship. 
For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the trespass of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the gracious gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. Remember that right there in the back of your mind because that's the chief third example that we could discuss about. Verse 16, And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on one hand, the judgment arose from the transgression resulting in condemnation, but on the other hand, the gracious gift arose for, from many transgressions resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one death reigned until uh, uh, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. Federal headship. Adam, when he sinned in the garden, he brought death to all his posterity. You and I fell in Adam. You and I were represented in Adam. Now, in our minds, we might not like this, and we'll chat about that here in a moment, but I want to give us a second example to discuss this. The second example is Noah as a covenant head of the Noahic covenant found in Genesis chapter 6. You can turn there if you'd like with me. Or you can just listen along because this is just going to be a short moment to spend in Genesis. But Genesis 6, verses 5 through 8 is where we're going to look at this right here. Genesis 5, or Genesis 6, 5 through 8 says, says this for us. Then Yahweh saw that the evil of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil and co evil continually. That's, that's how man had fallen. We had fallen and now we are dead in our sins and all our thoughts are evil to God. Now, pause right there and just notice in there, all men. Every man on the face of the earth has fallen and evil and are undeserving of God's grace. This is a, a remarkable text because follow this here. In, in, we're going to see in verse 8 something remarkable take place. In verse 6 it says, And Yahweh regretted that he had ever made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. And Yahweh said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things, and to the birds of the sky. For I regret regret." That I have made them. Verse 8 is remarkable. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Was Noah deserving? What did verse 5 just tell us? All men, wicked, undeserving. But Noah found grace. Noah found favor. He was granted something that was outside of himself. Now, look at verse, or chapter 7, verse 1, if you're there in Genesis 6 with me. 7, 1 says this. Then Yahweh said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this generation. Why did the seven other family members of Noah enter the ark? Because Noah alone found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Because of the righteousness that was granted to Noah, the others were included into the ark. Were they found righteous? No. But they gained entrance to the ark because of the righteousness found in another. Federal headship. The one person Noah represented the others. So now what is the chief example that I've spoken about? What... What is the chief example of federal headship, the third one that we will be discussing today? As I made mention of, many people despise the doctrine of federal headship. And you've got to ask yourself, why is this? Why, why is it that people don't like the doctrine of federal headship? 
Well, it's because it maintains that due to the sin of another man, Adam, we now suffer death and our nature has been corrupted. However, I want you to love this doctrine. I love this doctrine. Why? Because it does not end in Adam. Federal headship proclaims the gospel because it maintains that through the life of another, Jesus, you and I have been redeemed, saved, and reconciled unto him. We fell in Adam. Who saves us? The one man, Jesus Christ, in whom he represented us upon the cross. This is a glorious doctrine. This is a great thing to be considering. So... Let's consider several texts that demonstrate how Christ has redeemed us as our covenant head, as our federal head. And keep in the back of your mind that verse from Romans 5 that references Jesus as such. And let's now turn to Colossians 2, 13 to 14. Colossians 2, 13 to 14. Colossians 2, 13 to 14 for this. Thirteen says this, and you being dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him, having graciously forgiven us of all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. So listen to this, brothers and sisters. This is this is a remarkable thing, dear friends. We have been made alive together with Christ. And it says that he canceled out the certificate of debt, our sin that we have committed against God. When did he do this? The text tells us when he did this. Was it when you believed? Is it when you see Christ come in the second coming? Is that when he paid this price? No, it says this. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it, to the cross. Your sin debt was paid before you even ever believed in Jesus Christ. He is our federal head. He represented you and I upon the cross without you ever acknowledging him. While you were yet enemies to Christ, he died for you. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5.21, please. 2 Corinthians 5.21. About a week after I was saved, this was the verse that opened my wife's eyes to know Jesus Christ. And so I'm kind of partial to this text. Almost, It's one of my favorite ones because of this. But 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. He made him who knew no sin... To be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, who had never committed any act of indecency towards God, but was holy and righteous and obedient through His whole life. Romans 6.23, it says, For the wage of sin is death. What did Christ suffer for you and I? Death. Did he ever commit a sin to earn that wage? No, he did not. He died undeservingly in your place, in my place, in Paul's place, in all the church's places. He died undeservingly. And you might think to yourself, how could one man atone for... For all my sins and my my friend's sins, how could this one man die for not only two people's sins, but for all of us in this room's sins? How could Jesus die for all those that would have faith in him? How, How could Jesus atone for this? Because Jesus is worth more than all of us combined. He is of infinite wealth and infinite riches. This is the significance of Christ dying in our place. This is the one who is holy, 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 who is deserving of all worship and glory, coming down in humility, dying for us. 
in our place as our federal head. This is a glorious doctrine. To the person who says, I don't like federal headship. Oh, you are far removed from understanding the character of Christ, if that's the case. Because Christ represented you and I when he died for us. Let's turn to one more place in, in reference to this before we go back to Galatians 2.20. 1 Peter 2.24, if you wouldn't mind turning there. 1 Peter 2.24. 1 Peter 2.24. Who himself, this is speaking of Christ, Christ bore our sins in his body, on the tree, so that having died to sin, we might live to righteousness. By his wounds, you were healed. Where did, did we not read that this morning for our call to worship? As we came to worship God this morning, we read a text about him dying for us. We are to... We are to recall this. We are to remember this. We are to preach this to ourselves every single moment, brothers and sisters, because guess what? The flesh is desiring to take your mind captive away from that thought. It wants to seek to justify you at every corner because guess what? It can't. But that's the flesh that wages war within us. If we don't remind ourselves of this truth, guess what we will end up as? The churches of Galatia needing a rebuke and a reminder of the grace of Jesus Christ. So now let's turn back after we, after we read this. So, so we're, we, our sins were bore by Christ there. He became sin on our behalf. It was nailed there 2,000 years ago. Now listen to what Paul says again. Now that we know all this in the back of our mind, Galatians 2, 20. Galatians 2.20, what does it say again? The text that we've been, we're examining today. I have been crucified with Christ. So what does it mean to be crucified with Christ? It means that he who is undeserving stood condemned in your place, suffered the wrath you deserved, and redeemed you in the whole process. Christ who was undeserving, Christ who was undeserving of your curse became a curse so that you who are undeserving of His grace, would receive His grace. For I have been crucified with Christ. What does it then say? It says after that, so that I might live to God, or excuse me, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. What, what does this mean when it says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me? What is it getting at? What is Paul referring to or, or trying to, what is he teaching us in this? This is a reflecting statement from verse 19. And it is a paradoxical statement. In verse 19, we see, let's go ahead and read verse 19. It says, for through the law, I die to the law so that I might live to God. So for through the law, I die to the law. But now what is Paul saying in here? So while living under the law, we have died to the law. But now in our state of justification, we have died with Christ and now live unto him. So we lived unto the law, we died to the law. We now die with Christ, and now we are called to live unto him. A reflecting, paradoxical statement that is right here. And this statement is one of humility, and is completely contrary to that of a person who seeks to justify themselves through the law like the Judaizer would be in this text. The law produced, listen to this, the law produced Pharisees and an evil attitude of boasting above one another. Let's say you die today, and you go and stand before God, and you think to yourself, what is the, what is the most good thing I have done? Well, I, hope I helped an old lady cross the street once. So you proclaim that to God at your death. I helped somebody across the street. God, that's why I should, I should be rewarded. Guess what I'm going to do when I die? Jim Bob who said he helped one person. God, I helped 10 old ladies cross the street. Look at how good I am. I should be rewarded. You die, and guess what you're going to try to proclaim? Braden, that ain't nothing. I helped 20 people cross the street. The next person, 30. The next person, 40. The next person, 50. What The law is, is constantly used 
by you and I as a stepladder in an attempt to look better than the next person. Look, look and consider Luke 18, 9 through 14. You don't have to turn to this one with me. It says in there, though, he also told this parable to some who were trusting in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Right? So, so I, I'm righteous because I helped 20 old ladies cross the street. I'm better than the person that let, helped 10. I'm treating others with contempt. This is the parable that Jesus says in, in relation to this. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, ex extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. You might have thought to yourself, and Braden say in the whole helping an old lady cross the street, is that, that no one would do that. Paul, or Jesus here is saying, there's people that come to before God in prayer and say, look how good I am. I fast. I tithe. Look how good I am, God. This is what God, this is what God in flesh, Jesus himself says about this whole incident. He says, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But beat his breast. So he's beating his chest. And he's saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So now consider that here in Galatians 2.20. When it says, it is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. Paul is essentially saying everything I have done, whether it was going to prison, receiving room, wounds, proclaiming the gospel, or any other number of supposed goods that I, Paul, have done, it was all Christ who did it through me. It was all Christ who did it in me. It wasn't of me. It was all Christ. This is the Christian's attitude when they proclaim the gospel and to others and how they ought to be thinking about it in themselves is with this type of sentiment. Whatever good thought, deed, or action, or intention I have ever done in life, it was because Christ was working in me. The rest that is evil and vile and sinful unto God, that was all me. That, that's my responsibility in this whole thing. All the good is of God and nothing good resides in me. Outside of Christ, we use the law to justify ourselves that just keeps heaping more and more burning coals upon our head. But now in Christ, we are sprinkled with more and more grace every single day. Let's look again here at Galatians 2.20. It says this, For I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, Paul says, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. The life which I now live, I live by faith. So now that we are alive in Christ, now that, now that we recognize him and place our faith in him, we recognize him as our federal head, that he died undeservingly for me in my place there upon the cross, what are we now called how to live? What, what are we called unto living like? Are we to run back to the yoke to justify ourselves or to maintain our righteousness that Christ purchased for us? Are we to circumcise ourselves thinking that this will give us a correct standing before God? Or even from our Bible study on Wednesday, are we to return back to the mountain that produces death? No, we don't do that. Of course not. The life we now live is a life that is continually finding its resting place in Jesus. The life... We are now to live continues to beckon to the cross. The life we now live is seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Our Lord Jesus is who we're with. The faith we possess is a living faith and not a dead one. Romans 1, 16 through 17 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The life we live is lived by faith in Christ who is active within us. Again, we can look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This type of faith that you and I have is the same type of faith that all our forefathers in the faith had and possessed in the coming seed prior to the cross. Just as they looked forward to the Messiah, now we look back to his life, death, burial, and resurrection. It's the same type of faith that Abraham had and was reckoned righteousness with. It's the same type of faith that caused Abraham to trust in God who commanded him to slay his only son. It is the same type of faith that Moses had while living in the wilderness as he longed for a land that he would never possess. It's the same type of faith that Ruth possessed as she wanted to be redeemed. It's the same type of faith that David had who knew that the Lord would sit a descendant of his upon the throne. We possess the same type of faith that all these saints of old possessed. We have faith in the Son of God who died for us, the Son who has brought us into the land, the Son who has redeemed us, and the Son who is sitting upon the throne currently. We live a life trusting in that which has been done and accomplished for us. Not in something that you and I can do to earn this. We trust in the finished and completed work of Christ Jesus. So then in here in verse 20, again, we're not done looking at this text. There is so much to cover here. It says, I live by faith in what? What does it say that we have faith in? The Son of God. Friends, our faith is only as good as the object that we put it into. We do not place our faith in created beings, but we place our faith in the creator and sustainer of all creation. We don't place our faith in a being that requires our works for righteousness or requires works to be able to receive his atonement. We don't place our faith in that type of individual, but we place our faith in a Christ, in the Jesus of the Bible, who finished his work completely for us. We don't place our faith in a wide way or an open gate, but we place our faith in the one who says he is the shepherd, he is the door, he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. We do not place our faith in an impersonal God who does not care for us, but we place our faith in the Son of God. And and what does it say about the Son of God in this text? Who loved us. I want to speak personally with this. When the weight of my sin was laid upon Jesus Christ's shoulders... He loved me. When he was spat on, despised, and cursed at, he loved me. When he was pierced and nailed to the cross in my place, he loved me. When he became a curse, he who knew no sin became sin. He loved me. You and I, when we go work for our neighbors, how often is it to be, we're so quick to start kicking them in our minds, right? And say, man, I'm just really upset I have to do this work for them, right? We're quick to do the work of works, the most ultimate good thing ever. He loved us. There's a wonderful song called, the, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. We've sang it several times here at this church, but in the third verse it says this. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, far surpassing all the rest. It's an ocean full of blessings in the midst of every test. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, mighty Savior, precious friend. You will bring us home to glory where your love will never end. I would ask you to turn to this verse with me, though. Let's let's go to Romans 5, 7 through 11, please. Romans 5, 7 through 11. I should have told you to keep a bookmark in chapter 5 because we're going back there. Like I said, this is, the, this is one of the most richest and deepest parts of our Bibles that we have. 
Romans 5, 7 through 11. Think in the back of your mind when Christ says the greatest love that someone can have is when they lay down their life for a friend. This is the greatest type of love. Look at 7. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. That's speaking of, of you and I. Would we readily die for one another in this room? How about this? Would we readily die for the stranger we have never met down the road? Would we readily die for the person who has kicked our family? Would we readily die for our employer who fired us? Would we readily die for all the evil actions of men that have done things against us? Would we readily die for them? But God demonstrated his own love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. But for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall, we shall be saved by his life. The atrocities that we can think that we have committed to others and others have committed to us pales in comparison to the atrocities of what sin is to a holy God. Yet that holy God, in the midst of us reviling against him, us spitting in his face, he died for us because he loved us. He loved us when we were enemies to him. When he was being pierced upon the tree, he knew each and every one of us. And he loved us why we hated him, why we rejected him, why we sinned against him, and why we didn't place our faith in him. He still loved us why we were yet enemies to him. You can see now the importance, right? Uh, what, what does me saying... I have been saved through my own actions due to the blood of Christ. It's, it's not enough, Jesus. I can complete the work that you couldn't have. Blasphemy. May it never be ever cross in our minds that it is anything that you and I that contribute to our salvation. It is Christ alone who loved me, who loved you. And dear friends, I want to ask you this question today. Will you consider the love of Christ? How does this make you want to live tomorrow? Are you living a life of faith today? Is Christ living in you? This is, this is hard questions to ask yourself. Is Christ Jesus living in you? And most importantly, out of this whole text, has Christ died for you? Have you been crucified with Christ? I beg with you today, turn to the love of Christ, and I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Why you are yet an enemy to him, he died for you because he loves you. And he rose again, defeating death in your place. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for the love that you have given to us. The love that has been demonstrated to us. The love that has been undeservingly showered upon us. Lord, the fact that we can even be in your creation is a great mercy and grace to us. But yet, to live in your creation as fallen man who have been justified in Jesus Christ, Lord, is something that words cannot describe the great love that you have shown to us in this. Lord, may we cast all our sins to you and recognize that it is not us who pays for them but it is you and you alone that has saved us through the propitiation of Jesus Christ. 
And it is upon that man who died for us, Jesus, in our place as our federal head, we lift this prayer up. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I would invite you, if you have faith in that gospel, if you've taken the sign of showing that you have died with Christ, I invite you to come and partake in communion today.